Look like you got quite a pad over there, my friend. Yeah, man. Uh, I live with my girlfriend. We got a two bedroom apartment and we got it all set up. Um, we live in a really cool area of uh, Medellin. It's inside of El Poblado. It's called uh, Ciudad del Rio. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so it's like right in the middle of everything. Uh, I love living the city life. This is the biggest city that I've ever lived in before. I think there's like six or seven million people here in Medellin. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Love wow. it, man. Cool. Yeah, well, we got and- a really good deal for this place. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're originally from America, I take it. Yeah, I grew up in North Carolina. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty darn amazing. So why don't we just jump right into this? We've already got a nice warmed up. So sure. why don't we jump right in there? Um, Michael Morrison, thank you yeah. for joining us on this podcast. You're an interesting one, because personally, I've been waiting to talk to you. So not to not to get to fan girl over it right away but you've just had an incredible story you've had a great run um i shouldn't say you've had a great run you're on a a great run and you have a phenomenal story so let's start from the highlights let's get let's let's get everybody all amped up here and then we'll work our way backwards that sound fair enough yeah sounds good all right so you started only just five months ago from uh, i believe very little experience and uh, now today you're at over 30 units. So how many units are you at exactly today? Yeah, so uh, you're correct. Like you mentioned, my first unit went live June 1st. Um, and uh, since then, so I have 26 listings that are live, but actually just signed contracts for seven more properties. Um, we're starting to uh, do more co-hosting deals just because um I'm in a a pretty unique situation and maybe we can expand on that in in a little bit, but um, essentially I've got a, um, a guy who goes and and finds really good deals for me. That's what he does all day. And uh, so now we're starting to do more co-hosting. So I just signed seven more properties. We'll have those uh, hopefully contracts signed this week and then have those up and running within the next two weeks. Uh, So that would bring, what is that? 33. 33. For those of you who are just joining us, Michael here started about five months ago with zero properties. He's got 20, sorry, was it 28 right now? Live? 26 live and then seven more coming soon. 26 live, seven in the pipeline. But um, most recently you signed, I think this was just in October, you signed a 12 unit deal Mm -hmm. with six weeks free on every single listing. Mm-hmm. And one of your newest, par- one of your partners uh, gives you official access to, I believe, over 650 units as well. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So the uh, the 12 unit deal that you're talking about, um, I picked up the keys to that unit, uh, I think, October 20th. Mm-hmm. And so um, the, the way that we built in that six weeks of free rent was I picked up the keys October 20th didn't pay the first check until November 1st, but that was 50% of what it should have been. And then again, paid 50% in December. And, uh, you know, actually to add to that, I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to renegotiate that contract again. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm about 85% confident that I'm going to cut the cost another, you know, 45%. Perfect. Uh, We're going to come full circle because I know you had a renegotiation on another project a few months ago that you guys got into. So let's start with some highlights first off so we can really get the audience to understand how just how far you've come in five months. Um, Can we talk numbers? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Zero to 26 units in five months. What would you say your gross monthly uh, revenue is right now? Yeah. So, you know, that's an interesting question, right? So with my, with my properties, 25 of them are one bedroom studio apartments. Mm -hmm. That's been kind of my bread and butter so far. Uh, One is a, is a four bedroom apartment. Um, But for those, I, I double my money on every unit. Um, Beautiful. Now for those, you know, so I've got about, um, so out of the 26 that I made, so for example, last month in November, I net about $18,000 profit uh, after wow, expenses. Wonderful. So, wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm making somewhere around $800 to $900 per room. Wonderful, wonderful. And yeah. is that uh, dollars or euros? Because I know we, we were chatting a little bit about that in the pre-show here. 
So that, that's another really great thing, right? So if I had this exact same business model in the US, the, you know, the profit margins would be higher. But also, like you mentioned, we're, you know, the $18,000 that I made last month, that's US. But I don't spend US dollars. I live in Colombia. So I spend Colombian pesos. And so the buying, the buying power of that $18,000 is at least 3x. I mean, $1 right now is uh, about 4,800 Colombian pesos as of today. Incredible. Incredible. Okay, let's let's rewind back to day one and let's try and cram five months worth of production into uh, 50 minutes. Ready? Sure, let's do it. All right, Michael Morrison, you started off in North Carolina. So where did you start and what were you doing before short-term rentals? Yeah, so um, I was a financial advisor for about eight years and I worked for a, uh, a very large uh, national brokerage firm. And so I would help clients plan for retirement. I would help them with their investments I would help them, you know, create retirement income. So just all things retirement planning. And um, so I managed a large book of business. It was about 250 million in assets, roughly. Um, and I really, you know, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, sorry, let me just decline that call. Um, and I, you know, I really, I really had a passion for working with people. I, you know, I learned a lot about sales and customer service, and that was really great. But for me, you know, my whole life, I've always wanted to travel the world. I've always wanted to be able to live abroad. And I had started coming down to Medellin, Colombia on vacation, just kind of out of random luck with a friend. And I started to meet a lot of folks down here that had various forms of online businesses, whether, you know, the digital nomad lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really just got a firsthand look for the type of lifestyle that they lived. They could you know, work from wherever in the world that they wanted to, uh, you know, they had employees that could help offload the, the work set. And, you know, they didn't have to be lazy couch surfers to do it, you know, they could also make good, uh, good income and provide for themselves and, you know, for their, their families as well. So I really just started saying like, okay, there's, I, I know there's something more, I don't, I don't know what the next step is, and I did research on various business models for about a year straight. And, um, you know, I always believed in coaching. I think coaching is by far, you know, investing in yourself is the best thing that you can do uh, to increase your earning power. So, you know, I bought kind of various programs here and there, not just Airbnb related, but related to all things. I was just kind of trying to get a feel for what it is I wanted to do. And, um, a friend of mine had, had actually started an arbitrage business model in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, sorry, I keep getting there. Call, let me turn that off. Um, but yeah, so I, he, he was doing the arbitrage model and I started asking questions. And at first it was kind of more of a, he wanted me to invest in his business, but I was running the numbers and I was just trying to figure out like why the returns were so good. It didn't make sense. It seemed almost too good to be true. And then really the light bulb clicked when I started to do some YouTube research that this wasn't just an investment. It's a, it's a real business opportunity that you can scale and you can use to make a lot of income. And, um, and so I had started, you know, really looking into rental arbitrage and I did a bunch of YouTube research and, you know, found various people, various, you know, quote unquote gurus who had had information online. Um, but I came across Sean's program. And, um, you know, there was a, a number of things that really resonated uh, with me from Sean's program. Uh, number one being that he had a bunch of free videos online. And it wasn't that I was, you know, trying to be cheap or cut corners or anything. It's just that, you know, it's, it's almost sometimes hard to believe somebody on the internet that you've never met before, right? Are they really good at what they do? Do they really know what they're talking about? Or are they, you know, full of it? But with Sean's free videos, he was given a ton of value out and asking for nothing in return. I mean, there was no secret credit card subscription or something like that. It was just genuinely free material. And I learned a ton. But, you know, the, 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 that additional material made me say, hey, like I, I have some extra questions and I, I would love to have some kind of one-on-one -on -one 
type of relationship where I could call somebody and just say, hey, like I'm going through this specific situation, you know, how, how can I get through it? So that's when I signed up for the program and um, I've been super impressed since. You know, that's great. Now, were you already decided that you were going to start a rental arbitrage business prior to jumping into the program or were you still in the research phase? So I was in the research phase, but, you know, I was, I was more at a, at a, at a position in my life where I had had enough money saved for my prior job that, and, and the cost of living was so low in Colombia. Um, you know, that realistically, I could comfortably live down here for about $1,500 a month US, $2,000 a month US. So I said, you know, I, I was ready to transition and take a chance by starting a business. Um, you know, at first, I didn't know that this was going to work so well, quite frankly. So I was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm willing to try this business model. Even if it doesn't work, I have enough money to live down here for, you know, a while and if I can't get anything working, I could always just move back to the United States and try to get another, you know, good job again. But, um, but yeah, so, so I signed up for the program before I had officially quit my job. And, um, you know, as I was going through the program, I was like, this makes perfect sense. I mean, this business model is, you know, we're, we're essentially letting Airbnb and, you know, here in my region, I use booking.com a lot. I'm letting those two platforms do the majority of my marketing and they have a audience worldwide. So they're spending all the millions of dollars that they spend on their marketing budget. All I'm doing is fulfilling the product that they're marketing. And it was kind of like, I mean, I literally was just sitting there like scratching my head, like, what am I missing? Like, why isn't everybody doing this business model? It's, so simple. And even when I would tell my friends or my family, like, Hey, these are the numbers. If I go and I rent an apartment and I can invest in the furniture and then I can turn around and get this average nightly rate and get it at least like 70% occupied, I can make X amount. And they were like, yeah, but whatever. So it, it was just, uh, it was one of those situations where I, I took a chance. I signed up for the course. And then I, you know, just realized that if you follow somebody who has successfully done it and you follow their step-by-step -step instructions, it's, uh, I mean, it's pretty hard to fail. I mean, you kind of have to try to not do a good job. You know, I, I love that the most because um, we take a lot of calls here and I would say probably the number one thing that stops people is analysis paralysis. Yeah. It's that they're almost trying to find every reason why it won't work. Right. Mm -hmm. when, when, the, when the market's good, well, it's saturated. There's so many people in it. When the market's not at its peak, well, there's a recession. What if this? What if that? And really, the secret is you just laid it out. Find somebody who's already done it, who has a big body of evidence, and then follow them. Alex Hormozzi, Hormozzi famously says this, right? The yeah, fastest yeah. path. There's no shortcuts, but the fastest path is just find somebody who's already done it and just copy exactly what they do. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny because now, you know, I have a lot of my friends who have seen, you know, glimpses of the, the, the success that I've had so far. And so I've had a bunch of people start to ask me questions about it. You know, how'd you get started? I tell them that I hired a mentor. I, you know, I tell them about Sean's program and they ask, you know, because I tell them like initially when you can look at a price tag, you know, sometimes people can be a little nervous about that, right? Like, Hey, is it worth it? And, uh, you know, my question to them is like, well, if you think about a traditional university program, you know, people are paying 20, 40, 60, even sometimes 80 grand or more for a college education. And uh, not all the time, but a lot of times, you know, they come out and they make 40 or $50,000 a year, but they paid all of that money up front for that program and didn't think twice versus you know paying somebody who literally has the business that you want to start and is successful and is making money and has a proven track record and they can just say hey do this xyz step one two three and it just takes a lot of the guesswork out of it so um yeah I, i'm a firm believer in, in coaching and mentorship for sure yeah, uh, I'd like to touch on that too, where you say a lot of people get hung up on that number, right? Mm -hmm. But it's so funny because when they call us, they, we, you know, we always ask them, hey, what, what is your goal? 
because mm-hmm. we're going to customize the plan according to your goals. And they'll mm-hmm. they'll always say one of three things. I want 5,000 a month, I want 10,000 a month, or I want to make a million dollars. Every mm-hmm. single person says the exact same thing. And what's mm-hmm. funny about that is like 10,000 being the most common, a million dollars mm-hmm. being the second most common. But it's funny because to make, to l- learn the skills and have the structure and the playbook to generate something that creates $10,000 every single month. Because as you know, it's not hard. It's a few yeah. properties. You have your pieces in place and away you go. But once we get to that one number, they get so hung up on it that they can't see any further. Mm. So I love how you brought that up. Here's what is, what's interesting, though. Most people start in America. Uh, we have students in Canada as well. Canada and U.S. in terms of arbitrage, identical. Absolutely yeah. identical. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting about how you started was that um, you don't speak Spanish, from what I know. You speak a little bit of Spanish, mm-hmm. but you're going here pitching these uh apartment complexes without Spanish, A. And it wasn't very easy at first. You really had to grind it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. When I first moved here and and first started here, my Spanish was zero. I started from scratch. Um, Now that I've been here for about a year and a half, uh, my Spanish has gotten a lot stronger, but I'm definitely not at a point where, you know, I can go in um, and sit down at a table with locals and speak the local you know, language, um, you know, the people from Medellin are called Paisas. So I can't have that Paisa conversation. It's just not the same. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know, there's definitely been some different barriers, just, uh, you know, learning how this culture does business differently than we do it in the U.S., uh, what's similar, um, understanding what's important, what's not important. So, um, so yeah, you know, I learned very quickly that uh, I needed to get somebody who was a local uh, to help with that that part of the process. Um, and so, fortunately, uh, my girlfriend was a, a huge support throughout that process because she is local. She's paisa. She's fluent in Spanish, and you know, very presentable. And so, for me, that that helped a lot, especially in the early stages just build relationships uh, because that's the number one thing that I've learned about doing business in Medellin and in Colombia is that relationships are incredibly important. That's how, you know, that's how the wheel goes round. Um, and so we really just focused on trying to build the best relationships that we can. We would, you know, we would get a unit in a building and uh, buildings here, in Medellin, there, there's actually a number of obstacles. Number one is that uh, short-term rentals less than 30 days are actually illegal in the entire country unless the building or the property has a special tourism permit. Um, so, you know, the first thing is you got to identify buildings that have that permit that are open to let you do it. So we would kind of figure out a way to wiggle our way in there. Um, And then once we would, we would build relationships with the staff at the building. Um, So here, uh, the majority of buildings have what are called porteros, which are 24 seven doormen. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we would build relationships with the porteros. You know, we would show them that we do business in an honest way. We, you know, we're not doing anything under the table. We're not cutting any corners. We have a really good process. You know, we clean the apartments. We keep them maintained. Uh, you know, we we really do a good job making sure the you know that the guests that stay are people who are going to take care of the properties, etc. So we really would just build relationships, and um, that's been the name of the game here. And so. Recently, I got a huge breakthrough because um, I got introduced by my visa lawyer of all people introduced me to a guy who is originally from Medellin, but he's uh, he's based out of Miami and he has a, uh, you know, really big company. And um, basically, he just is a deal closer. He doesn't want to do the Airbnb side. He doesn't want to do the property management. He just wants to connect people and close deals. And so um, he is actually the guy who got me into the 12 unit building um, that I closed last month. And then now he is the one that introduced me to the guy who has 650 properties in three different countries. And that guy 
hired me to manage uh, seven of his properties here in Medellin. So basically he said, Hey, you know, if you do a good job, I don't want to be working with a bunch of different people. I just want a small group. So, you know, if you do a good job and we start to make some money, then I'm going to hire you for many, many more. And what's really cool is lately what we've been doing is kind of altering our contracts a little bit. So, um, you know, the big, the big kind of risk with rental arbitrage is that are you going to be getting a fair deal, right? Can you pay the monthly lease? Can you rent it out nightly? And is that arbitrage, you know, a good amount? So if you overpay for an apartment, that can obviously be, you know, a big obstacle. So one of the things that we're doing is now we're going to um, start acting as the property manager for these units. And we're actually going to get paid 30% of the gross revenue and we're going to handle the sales, the guest communication, the photography, the properties are all already furnished. Uh, so that's already covered. But uh, the owner is actually going to still pay for all the housekeeping and the maintenance. We're going to get 30% of the gross revenue. And we have written in the contract that within, you know, about a three to six month period, we have the right to make a, an offer for a leasing contract. And, you know, my, my thought process there is that, you know, if I'm managing the property for three to six months, I've got really good, reliable, firsthand data on what kind of occupancy I can get, what kind of average nightly rate I can get, what kind of crowd I'm marketing to, you know, who's my main client going to be. And, um, and then so I can use that information to make a, a really fair deal uh, that's, uh, you know, win-win for both parties. So we just started out with these first seven units and uh, hopefully we're going to scale a lot more. I mean, at this point, it's just a matter of, you know, we've got a, a really good system. So especially if I'm in a you know, position where I don't have to continue taking on all the rent without knowing kind of the final product, basically I eliminate my risk. So we can scale really as many properties as we can get our hands on. So I, uh, you know, I, I would not be surprised if I got to a hundred doors, you know, within the next 12 months, um, you know, that, that would be a hundred more doors in the next 12 months. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we could get to a hundred total in probably seven or eight months from now, if, you know, if yeah. it to go well. Your trajectory is definitely heading that way. Um, about this, uh, this way that you're changing the contracts, I'm just curious if you're if your revenue sharing for the first few months. Let's say that the thing is performing at a very high level. What's the incentive for the owner to then switch to a leasing model? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, that's that's one thing that we talked about ahead of time. And quite frankly, we just have a lot of negotiating power um, because what we can do is pick up a ton of units. And the reality is that, you know, if we're able to introduce this arbitrage model into the contract, then we're going to manage that for years to come. So really, it's more about setting the expectation that, you know, hey, this property management deal that we have is really more so um, for both parties to figure out what a fair deal is. But it's only going to last for three to six months. Like after that, if you don't want to continue, you know, if you don't want to, if we can't come to some kind of good deal on a lease, then, um, you know, we're going to part ways. So especially here, it's like when, when you have good people that are reliable, you have a good thing going, um, you know, we basically in our negotiate, uh, in our negotiations, the owner said, hey, I, I really just want that guaranteed reliable income. And we could take a lot of units off his hands. Mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. I think that's in this business, I think that's when you can start to get a lot of negotiating power. A lot of bargaining power is when you're picking up multiple units. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I wouldn't suggest doing that right at first because, you know, when you first start, like you're going to make mistakes, you're going to do things right. You're going to do some things wrong. You're going to say, ah, I wish I would have done that differently. So you want to give yourself some breathing room until you kind of get, um, you know, get a grip on things. But, you know, this business compared to other businesses, it doesn't take long at all. I mean, we're talking about like two or three months before you can really start to get a hang of it and start to scale. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, one thing I would suggest to anybody listening to this podcast is that especially when it comes to acquiring properties, 
don't have limiting beliefs. Like you can you just be very surprised how you can start to negotiate, especially as you grow your business and really get, you know, bargaining power. I mean, we've we've asked for things that quite frankly, in my head, I'm like, there's no way that this person's ever going to agree to this, but I don't show it on my face. And then next thing I know is they agree to it. Um, this deal where we're going to make 30% and then we get to offer, uh, you know, at least six months into it. I never thought that anybody would go for that, but you know, we've made it happen. So just get rid of the limiting beliefs, have a coach that can, you know, talk you through the good and, and the bad and uh, you'll be good to go. I love how you've really outlined these, uh, these important aspects, of course, the contracts, limiting beliefs and relationships. Now, in the beginning, though, because you can easily track your history, you weren't good at, doesn't seem like you're very good at, well, I shouldn't say no, you weren't very good, but you were very uh, fresh in terms of contracts in the real estate slash arbitrage. Yeah. Uh, but as for um, relationships, it seemed like you really leaned on the community, the Facebook community inside the group. So mm -hmm. how did that guide you along the way? Because you were very active in the Facebook group. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I had, uh, you know, just left a cushy job to pursue, you know, at the time, an unknown business for me. I mean, I have zero real estate background. Um, you know, I've never been into property management before. I mean, this was, you know, signing up for Sean's program was literally my day one. It was class 101 for me. Um, and so, you know, what's what's good is it's just, you know, it's good to have other people that are going through the same thing that you're going through. You know, one of the reasons why people can get really good in a job working up the corporate ladder is because they have a manager, they have coaches, they have trainers, they have colleagues where you can say, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing today. What do you have that's working? And just having that back and forth. I mean, that goes so far. That's one of the things I learned kind of through this whole COVID pandemic when you know I had to work from home and I wasn't in the office anymore, is it makes a big, big difference. And so I think one of the scariest things for people considering, you know, being becoming an entrepreneur or you know a business owner is, you know, this idea of having to go completely solo, you know, by yourself. There's no one there for you. It's sink or swim. It's you know, doggy dog and. Um, you know, so just having a community, having, you know, not only the live calls with Sean, where we can, you know, hop on a phone call once a week, every Saturday. And now uh, I know Monish is doing uh, a call on Wednesday. So now you've got two phone calls uh, that you can jump into. But then also you're, you're just going to have questions in between those times. And so being able to go into the Facebook group in, in particular and talk to other people who are, you know, in the trenches with you going through the exact same stuff. Um you know, and you can just exchange goodness. It's almost, you know, like having a, a constant brainstorming session. So there's a lot of really successful people. And I think that's also another thing is, uh, you know, I've, I've joined prior groups on different, you know, types of business models aside from Airbnb. And uh, there's always, it, it's always concerning when like no one in the group is successful yet. Like mm -hmm. all like not doing well. So in this group in Cracking Super O's, you, you know, not only have Sean that's doing really well, but you have other students, like not coaches, but just students that are doing really well and growing really good businesses and, you know, making really good income for themselves and their family. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, a big sign. I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that um, we say lots is that solopreneurship is the hardest sport in the world because you're literally playing a team sport all by yourself and you have to not just cover every position you have to learn every position from scratch so mm -hmm. solopreneurship for those who are out there doing it great but for those who um who haven't dove into it don't listen to gary v it is the hardest thing to do and hustle culture will just burn you out and that's why having a community is so important like you said having people that know exactly what you're going through having yeah. people that have success or if you've been doing it for a long time being part of a, of a group of like-minded individuals to reignite the fire. If you've been doing it for long enough and you feel like it's just a job, huge yeah. things, huge yeah. things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, one of the most interesting things, and I think one of the biggest worries when people start is, well, what if I get into a lease 
and I'm stuck with a bleeding lease. It's one of the biggest worries. Well, you got into one of those early in your career. It was a multi-unit deal. You were all excited about it. I think you were working on it for a few weeks. You had done your analysis. You signed the deal. You started it. All of a sudden, a few weeks later, I think a month later, holy cow, it's not performing how my analysis came. Can you walk us through that, that story? Yeah, so that's actually this prior 12 unit building I was just talking about. I got in there about two, two and a half months ago. And that was the first time I had ever had, you know, a, what I consider a major real estate type of negotiation. Um, you know, I have a sales background. And so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty good uh, in conversation, but negotiating and specifically about real estate in a foreign country. Um, was definitely something new to me. So there's a lot of things I felt like I did well. Uh, so that was the, the building where I got the six weeks of uh, free rent on all of the apartments uh, in the building. And, um, and I had gotten, you know, what at the time, what I considered a, a good deal. But I, I had a miscalculation about what the market wanted here. So Medellin is a, is a really unique market because it's in a, it's in a period of transition. Um, you know, so five years ago, um, as far as, you know, most Americans were concerned, it wasn't like a major travel destination for Americans quite yet. Um, but, you know, over the last couple of years, and especially since the COVID pandemic, you know, also known as the Great Resignation, you know, everybody was working from home, everybody, you know, I, I, especially in my generation, a lot of, you know, 30 and unders wanted something different. They didn't want to go back into the office. They wanted to work uh, remote, work from a computer, kind of figure out that next step. And so tourism has been picking up like absolute wildfire here in Medellin. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that in the next five to 10 years, it's going to be, you know, a global uh globally integrated city. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's in a position where, you know, the, the real estate market was very, very low because now all of a sudden you had a bunch of foreign investment coming into the market, a bunch of Americans bringing American dollars and then taking $1 and turning it into 3,000 and then 4,000 and now 5,000 Colombian pesos. And so our buying power was, was a lot. Um, and so the, the market has just kind of gone like this, just skyrocketing up, whether it's, you know, long-term rentals, whether it's midterm rentals, short-term rentals, the market's just going up. But I feel like the people that are here, the people that have known about Medellin, whether it's locals or even foreigners that, that kind of started traveling before everyone else here, um, really want to hold on to that, like, Hey, culture. Gonna, yeah, exactly. My money is going to go really, really far. You know, they're just not accepting that the market is, is getting much higher. And so I, I kind of miscalculated, right? Because my initial properties were, um, I, I call them mid range, mid level properties. Um, you know, I would rent them for about $500 per month. I actually got this apartment for $600 per month, uh, USD. So, you know, nice apartments, but kind of middle of middle of the scale. Um, and they were working really well. And my occupancy was like 95% just every single month, I was doubling my money, I was, you know, making 500 turn into 1200 uh, on each property that I was getting. So it was working really well. Um, I just assumed that this new building because it's decorated very nice. Uh, the apartments are really spacious. Um, each unit is themed after a different city or country in the world. And it's in one of the best locations in Medellin. It's right near this section called Provenza, but it's not literally in it. It's just outside. So you get the quiet, but you can also walk to the middle of everything. So, so I, I took all those factors and I said, okay, great. You know, I, I think I can get 150, $160 a night on average for my nightly rate. And I think I can get 70 to 80%. But the big miscalculation that I made was that they are one bedroom units. And so the reason why that's an issue is because um, right now, these one bed units, uh, the, the market that I can target is either the solo traveler or the couple, right? The 
you know, two people willing to sleep in, in one bed, right? Um, and so there is some of that market out there, but uh, I'm missing out on 70 to 80% of the tourism market, which is, you know, you know, a couple guys coming down for a fun weekend or a couple girls coming down for a fun week, you know, people coming for seven or 10 days with two or three or four of their friends. And, uh, I, you know, the, these properties aren't able to sleep. I, I would need to get, you know, at least two or two more beds in each unit, be able to say, you know, sleep six to eight to really get that $160 uh, a night uh, price. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a problem. I admit I was, you know, I was, um, yeah, just stressed out about that, right? It's, it's kind of that initial concern is what am I going to do if I can't pay the rent? Um, so, you know, in this case, I just kept, you know, going into the calls with Sean, uh, kept asking questions in the, in the uh, Facebook group about, you know, feedback on my units. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback. So we're actually uh, installing air conditioned units uh, in the building. So we're going to have central AC. We improved our Wi-Fi. We're getting more beds in there. So we're about to bulk order some queen and king size beds. And um, so those are going to really push the numbers up. But this is why it's important when you do a large deal um, to have that kind of runway. That's one of the, the reasons I think Sean uh, teaches and emphasizes so much about negotiating uh, the concessions on the front side, things like free Absolutely. rent, discount on rent, because it, it really, you know, I paid 50% um, for each month. So I am making right now around what I should be paying in rent. But the rent that I actually pay is 50% of that amount. So I'm doubling, I've doubled my money in November and doubled my money so far in December. Um, and what's great is when you're picking up bulk units, it gives you the ability to negotiate a lot. Yeah. Um, because what I'm going to essentially say to this guy who, you, you know, and again, it, in business, you don't look to, you always want to do the right thing. So you never want to take advantage of people, but you understand that in business, you can use leverage. And so the leverage that I have is that, you know, this guy has many other projects going on that he needs funds for, that he needs to allocate money to, and he doesn't want to be in the business of the short-term rental game, trying to get, you know, guests in and out and running that whole side of the business. So I can go and I'm going to offer him a, much lower deal than we initially have. And I know that he's going to take it because I have the ability to walk away scot-free if he doesn't. And um, so I can use that leverage. And, and, you know, with this new offer that I'm going to make him, it's going to be win-win for both because essentially we're going to be splitting the profits 50-50, which I think is a fair, you know, business arrangement between two people. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a part when people are looking for a course, um, they don't realize that, you know, you, you know, that old, uh, uh, what's that called the, um, oh, I'm butchering, so I'm not going to go into it. But a lot of people think they know more than they actually know when starting off an Airbnb. So everybody, when they call me, I, I talk to callers often where they say, uh, they say something like, well, all I need to know is how to get the property, how to talk to the landlord, get it on a contract and, uh, and make sure I don't lose money on, on the property. I'm like, you mean the entire business? Yeah. <laughs> From start to, you mean the entire business? And what's funny about that is they don't understand that getting a mentor isn't about learning the structure, right? The, 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 the main points. Everybody knows that you're supposed to get a property. Everybody knows you need to talk to the landlord. Everybody knows you need to be profitable. The question is, how? What are the nuances? And as you just outlined, it's not even about getting the first property. It's how do you receive as much of the upfront upside upfront so you can accelerate your cash flow. So people, a lot of times they conflate that arbitrage is just getting a place and putting on Airbnb, whereas Sean really teaches you that no arbitrage is using and capitalizing as much leverage as possible. So you can make the best deal possible. And that's really what the course does. Working with Sean 101 is teaching you the leverage points, understanding the nuances of the conversation. How do you put yourself in a position to get these kind of deals so that you can start scaling at a rate that, you know, people will make people's jaws drop? Yeah, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, in my opinion on that is that there's levels 
to this business. So, you know, I get this question a lot is, and even from my family members, um, you know, because yeah, if you, if you have happen to be a person who has a second home already, or you have a second, pro you know, property some way or some form, going over there and taking pictures with your phone and then creating a basic Airbnb listing is pretty simple. I mean, you don't, you, I would agree, you don't need to sign up for a course to be able to take photos on your phone and then create an Airbnb listing. It takes about 10 minutes to learn how to do that. And then you can set one flat nightly rate. And because Airbnb has, you know, the marketing budget that they do, you're going to get some level of business just simply by going through those basic motions. Um, so that, that is true. But, you know, if you're really in a position where you want to uh, increase and squeeze more out of the business, take it to a next level, make it more efficient, be able to scale it and make more money and not have to run, you know, this nightmare process. Because when you start to do five properties or 10 properties or 20 properties, you, you really have to create a system. Yes. And even, even if somebody is in a position where they only want to do one property or five properties, you know, in, in my perspective, Sean could simply just offer the module on pricing strategy and nothing else and charge the, the amount for the entire course. And the pricing strategy alone is by far the thing that's going to make you the most money out of any of the money. So even if you're in that situation where you have one property or three properties or just a small amount and the workload is not too much, learning a comprehensive and dynamic pricing strategy will help you get closer to 100% occupancy and it will help you increase your nightly rate. And you can, I mean, pricing strategy will squeeze another 40 to 50% in profit out of, you know, each property when it's done correctly. Um, and it'll help keep your income more stable year round when you go through the up seasons and the down seasons. So, you know, that, that alone, e even if you're thinking about this in a basic way, there is ways to make your listing better. There is ways you know, there are ways to improve your SEO and have better marketing position on the different booking platforms. There, there, you know, is a way to have a comprehensive pricing strategy so that you have better occupancy and a better uh, average nightly rate. There is a way to have systems in place for housekeeping and maintenance so that not only do your employees like you and want to work with you, but, um, you know, things are done correctly in the correct timing. So, it's just one of those things where like, okay, if you're brand new in this business, do you think you're going to be better or worse by partnering with somebody who has over a hundred properties who have been, who's been doing this for seven years, who can get on the phone? I mean, it's kind of like going on Shark Tank in some respects and, and having one of the sharks become a personal business partner. Uh, that's kind of how I think about this course. So yeah, I couldn't stress enough. Um, it, it's very worth the money. Wouldn't think twice when my membership runs out, I'm going to renew it every single time. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely worth every penny. I want to ask you two big, important questions. Sometimes we get members inside cracking super hosts who may message me a month later and say, Hey, Donnie, this isn't working. Um, I'm putting a question up on Facebook and nobody's answering me. But what's interesting is um, when I go back and look, they answer one question and then they're gone. We can also track all of our students, their progress. That's why sometimes students will get a call from me just to check up and, you know, a little kick in the butt. Hey, you, you need to actually do the work. Right. What was interesting is but when you first started, there was lots of questions that you answered in the beginning where sometimes you didn't get an answer, but that didn't deter you. So what was your, your, your thought process when first starting where, hey, I joined this group. I've gone through other courses. Some of them weren't good. I'm throwing up questions, not getting answered. Did that not deter you at all? No, I mean, you know, because the, the thing about it is, number one, whether Sean is the one answering the question or not, there's very commonly somebody in the chat who is going to answer your question and provide, you know, their viewpoint. Um, there's a lot of very experienced operators in the group that really know what they're doing, um, who could easily... Lots. Uh, yeah, you know, provide a lot of value and, and advice. So, um, you know, the, 
it's very uncommon that you'll ask a question and not one single participant in the group says something of value. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, at, at some point, you know, you got to like use this information and start to think for yourself because you are a business owner. This is your business. And yes, you've signed up for a course. But, you know, it is your responsibility to get the most out of that course. Like, you really can't rely on another person to provide. And, you know, they put the food on the table. You can't expect them to put the spoon in your mouth. Like, you got to you gotta start to, you know, flex your muscles. But, you know, but at the same time, the fact that you have one call every single Saturday is like, there's really never going to be a time where um, you have a question that's so urgent that somehow your business is going to end before Saturday. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, no, you just, you just start to get in a flow. You just, you write out the questions throughout the week that you have that are important to you. And then you ask them on Saturday and then you start to build processes for those things. I think right at first, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you're learning to swim for the first time, you know, you're, you're going to be totally fine, but you know, there's probably more flailing around just because it's something new that you're not used to. So, you know, you kind of have that panic emotion, but the reality is everything's fine. Just go back through the course, ask questions on Saturday. You get plenty of FaceTime. You know, now I don't even need to necessarily join every Saturday. I join most Saturdays because if I don't have a question, somebody else has a question about a situation that I'm either facing already or going to face in the future. Mm -hmm. So you really just get a lot out of that and you learn to start kind of walking on your own two feet and, and really start to build a process. And um, you just like anything else, if you put the work in, you know, what you put in is what you get out of it. Absolutely. Not to mention, it's not just the Saturday calls with Sean. We have the Wednesday calls with Monish. And then we have our third calls with Josh Fletch, which is coming up soon too. So three yeah. coaching calls in a week. Uh, yeah. I love the swimming analogy because that's actually what it feels like as a first time operator. There's a lot of flailing. You're just keeping your head above water, choking down water, but you get used to it fast. And next thing you know, you learn yeah. how to float. Then you learn how to paddle. Then you're swimming laps, baby. Right. Exactly. And you know, that's another thing is like, you know, you don't have to jump. If you're nervous to jump in, you don't have to jump in and pick up 25 leases at the same time. Just start one step at a time, get your first unit, go through, bump your head, you know, um, figure out what you know, figure out what questions that you have. And after you get your first uh, property profitable, then you can scale and get your second one. And then once the second one is there, you can get your third one. And, you know, then pretty soon you know what you're doing and you feel comfortable. And that's when you can start to do some more of the bulk unit deals and really, you know, get those negotiating muscles going. But um, yeah, yeah. And I say this all the time to everyone. And is that um, especially in rental arbitrage, one landlord will change your life. One landlord can have multiple units. One landlord can introduce you to other landlords, like in your case, or one landlord can introduce you to a property developer. And you will literally go from three to 15 overnight or seven to 25 overnight. It happens to almost everyone that stays in the game long enough. Here's my question for you. Um, you are one of the ones, I just love your story because it's almost, you beat all the odds. You're in a different country. You don't speak the language. You've never started a business before. But it feels like to me that one of your things that you kind of stuck with, right? One of your, your talents was building relationships, like you said before. So for those that are out there who are starting off, where they hear that, like, okay, building relationships, what does that mean? What would be some, you know, some uh, uh, explain to me like I'm five principles that you could share with others who are starting off? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and, and yes, I, you know, regardless of where you are in the world, uh, this is a relationship business. It's a hospitality business. So you have relationships with your guests, you have relationships with your landlords, and uh, you just never know what relationship is going to open the door to something big. Like I mentioned, my visa lawyer of all people, somebody not even related to this business at all. My visa lawyer introduced me to the guy who got me my 12 unit deal, who now introduced me to the guy who's got 650 properties. So, 
you know, I think phase one, like when you first start, if you're brand new doing this for the first time, it's going to feel a little bit like door knocking, right? Where you just kind of got to, you got to go out there. You got to call a bunch of people. You got to go in person. You got to get your, your, your name out there. You got to start putting your feet to the pavement. So I remember, you know, at first I, I admit I was a little discouraged, especially here because it's illegal. You know, I'm a foreigner. I don't speak the language. Uh, Airbnb itself has like a bad buzzword uh, because of foreign travelers who come here and don't, you know, respect uh, the, uh, the city. So there was a lot of obstacles, but at first you just, you do a lot of door knocking, you call a hundred people and maybe 99 of them tell you no, but there is going to be one person that says yes. It's, it's literally not nearly as rare as you think. You just assume that it's going to be rare. Um, but there's many, many people out there who are open to this business model. And I think at first, your biggest value add to uh, that single homeowner, that single property owner is, you know, hey, if you get a 12-month lease with somebody who's going to live here, maybe, just maybe, you get really, really lucky and you find somebody that's going to be a very, very clean tenant. They're going to take care of your property. They're going to repaint it. They're going to do deep cleaning every few months. And when they move out, they're going to return it good as new, right? But the chances are, I mean, anybody who's been renting out property for more than like one day knows that if you get enough tenants, there's going to be somebody who, you know, isn't too nice to your property. So would you rather have that or would you have rather have my company, a professional business that's focused on providing five-star vacation rentals to our guests, uh, you know, and if, and, and we are, you know, fiscally motivated to keep your house in the very best condition, uh, you know, we're going to improve the furniture, improve the design, we're going to take care of any minor maintenance issues, we're going to clean it, you know, I have five to six check-ins on average per month, and every single time somebody checks out, we do, we do a really, really good thorough cleaning of the apartment. So that's five to six times a month that your unit's going to be clean, right? That's the advantage. So you not to mention, that, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, after you. Uh, not to mention that, you know, for a landlord, for, you know, a small time landlord, one month of vacancy virtually almost wipes out your entire profit from that entire 12 month lease. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a ticking time bomb. So, you know, that's another that's another thing is, hey, you know, if you do get that tenant, every time that they move out, you got to go through this process and find them again. Whereas me, you know, as long as you let me, I'm going to keep renewing this contract every single year until you don't want to do this anymore. So I'll give you 100 percent occupancy on your unit for the next five years, the next 10 years. Right. And so that's a big value add. And, you know, when you do finally find that person, then either, either they have other properties because it's very common that if somebody has one rental property, they have more than one rental property. But even if they don't, at the very, very least, they can be a reference for you, right? They can mm -hmm. be a, a, you can literally give a resume out to new potential home, you know, property owners and say, hey, you know, don't take my word for it. Call this landlord. She's vouched for me. She'll tell you that, you know, I pay my rent on time. The property gets cleaned regularly. We, we take care of the maintenance. We keep it in good shape. And she's got 100% guaranteed occupancy. And so when you do that and you build those relationships and then you actually follow through and, and do what you promise, you take care of their property, you know, yeah, stuff happens, guests break things, but you know, Airbnb refunds those things. And so you just replace it, you take good care and you pay rent on time. And, um, you know, it, before you know it, you're going to meet that person. You, you never know who it's going to be, but you're going to meet that person who says, hey, well, you did a good job on this one. I didn't tell you before, but I actually got five other properties or I've got 10 other properties. You know, would you like to take a look at those? And uh, it, it happens, you know, for me, that, that exact thing happened where I was stuck on five, five of these one bedroom units, and I couldn't figure out how to get into a different building. I went and knocked on every, literally, we would ride around and look for, for rent signs on windows here and go knock on the door and 
offer them some money and say, Hey, if this is ever for rent, call me. Mm -hmm. That's literally what we do. We would do. And then one day it just, after enough door knocking, after asking everyone I know and just saying, Hey, this is my business. If you know anybody that's interested, let me know. And then eventually my visa lawyer got me in touch with the guy who signed that 12 unit deal. We picked up a couple extra units in our existing building. And, you know, now I've got a, I've got a lead for a very large property owner. So I love it. I love it. I love how you've really documented that. Hey, this, this isn't easy. It's not a fluke, but once you get it down, it happens really fast. And for those who've been following this series, you probably know that the people who have grown their businesses to 10, 15, 20, even 40 plus properties is that it wasn't easy for any of them. Monish used to get thrown out of buildings because he, he couldn't pitch right. You're going to riding and dialing. And the thing about all this is it, it's not easy at first, but once you get the foundation in, it explodes with rapid, rapid speed. And that's one of the beauties of uh, Airbnb, specifically rental arbitrage there. So um, yeah. final thoughts here. I really appreciate your time. But for those who uh, want to follow your journey and want to see more, maybe even ask you some questions, how can they find you? Yeah, so they can either follow my personal Instagram, which is underscore Michael dot Morrison with two R's. Um, my business Instagram is Casa Vela DIP. So that's C A S A V E L A V I P. Um, or just add me on Facebook. Again, my name is Michael Morrison and yeah, I love to um, I love to answer any questions. And I think, um, you know, just like you mentioned, you know, a lot of things are hard. Uh, a lot of things take hard work uh, to be successful. This is no different. But, you know, that's all relative. You know, if you're going to a job that you don't like, you feel like you're underpaid, you don't enjoy what you do, you dread going to work, you know, you count down the days until you have the weekend. Um, you know, if you're in that kind of position, then that's, that's difficult as well. So definitely take the plunge. It's not as bad as it seems. And having a mentor like Sean really makes everything a lot easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to thank you for, for sharing your time with us. For those of you that uh, have watched this, remember, you get to pick your difficult. So, so choose wisely. Um, wow. Again, my name is Donnie. I am part of Sean's digital team. If you guys like what we're doing here, tune in every single week as we talk to hosts, just like Michael here, and we peel back the layers and we want to figure out how they got there. Um, we're going to take you on this journey. Thank you for joining us. If you guys want to follow Michael or follow myself, we'll leave the, the notes, the show notes at the bottom or in the notes in the, in the audio. Thanks for joining us, guys. See you next week. See ya. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, man. Have a good one.